Then I will have each of the panel members spend maybe a minute or two uh, just to introduce themselves. Then I will pose two questions uh, to the panel and we will spend time exploring that those two questions and uh, take it from there. So it's a it's more of a free flowing conversation that I think we should have. So do pl uh, post your questions in the chat box because uh, we, uh, as we go forward, uh, I think Brian might be having his uh, eagle eyes on it, and then we can uh, ask a, a address those questions towards the end. So to start with, let me do my presentation here. So, employing the justice involved uh, uh, 6270 as part of the district, this is a Rotary Community Core initiative. It's a collaborative process for employing justice involved individuals. And what we are looking at is how Rotary as an organization can provide a, a framework and a structure to assist in the process. The Rotary Community Core is a team of non-Rotarians who are flexible partners in the service of Rotary Clubs. We have done a lot of work in other countries. We have gone to Guatemala, to India, to Kenya, to everywhere, Philippines, name a country. And we have done projects with the local community where the local community has been an integral part of our process while we provide the leadership and the expertise and the overall umbrella in terms of trying to get things done. Uh, the the Rotary International came up with the uh, 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 sort of strategy to say why don't we do something like this in our backyard? So two and a half years back, I uh, had our, our president was Kola I in there at that point. Uh, he had suggested that this is a a, a program that uh, was uh, direly sort of uh, a, a need. What it needed was some focus and some impact because of the fact of recidivism. So I said, yeah, that seems like an opportunity. And for the last two years, I have been speaking at Rotary Clubs uh, and, and networking with the community in general to understand what the issues are and how we can address it. So what we, the intent of this program, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, is to create a network of Rotarians who are business owners who are willing and step forward to say we will take the challenge of hiring and uh, 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 adopting if you may uh, formerly incarcerated or justice involved individuals uh, into the process and get them jobs so that they can have a second chance by doing this we will decrease the residuism rate which is the rate at which people go back in because when they come out there is the uh, reality that you are better inside because of the challenges outside and if those challenges are really dire and, 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 and constrained outside why not go back in because it's a much better place to i get food clothing housing shelter and everything else is taken care of but more so what is more important by doing this program is that we give people a second chance. So I did a process last year of studying the uh, re-entry, six month re-entry uh, process. I spent time with DOC agents and social workers and uh, for, uh, for uh, justice involved individuals and did a series of interviews over the course of three months to understand what the challenges are. And this is a six month, pro so the, in, in reality what happens is six months before a person comes out is when uh, the pl planning process starts on what you're going to have, uh, what the system is going to do for them in the areas of housing, transportation, identity, mental health, health care and jobs. But six months is kind of really the uh, state uh, rules, but it typically happens around three months. So one of the things that happens, and this is a Deloitte consulting study, that uh, I, I was uh, uh, privileged to get a copy of, which is they looked at the fact, what does it take a person to be successful and what are the failure points in a successful reentry process? Um, one is vocational training. If, if they don't have any training and education, that's a problem. Identification is another one. Do you have a social security card, your, uh, your state ID, or any, any identification that will help 
uh, sort of put credibility to, uh, to a person's identity, housing, employment, mental health. If any of these areas do not uh, uh, function the way should, the way they should, the success, the reentry is unsuccessful. And so I said, let's look at this problem and say, what can we do about it, and and how do we address it? So, in order for a uh, uh, for the reentry to be successful, there's an ecosystem. The ecosystem consists of how do you they, how they get their identity, uh, food on the table, housing, healthcare, mental healthcare, uh, training, transportation, and finally jobs. See. The, the thing is, we can give a person a job, but if they don't have any of these other preconditions, that job is just transitional because guess what? They're going to be late for work. They're going, they won't be interested. They don't, they don't have food on the table. So basically jobs fail. So in order to do, uh, address this, I have been working with a, a series of partners, some of whom are represented in this uh, uh, slide, uh, and, 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 and in terms of uh, how we can get employers where we will help with community education from a Rotary perspective and have other organizations that already exist, like UMOS and others, uh, uh, and uh, IESI, which is what uh, 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 Jamie is part of, and MC2, which is another organization that does apprenticeships. So, and there is another uh, 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 online tool that's been developed by a uh, gentleman by name of Ali uh, Rivera and, and Ruben Gaona called The Way Out that is an online platform that allows people to, it's like a Tinder uh, in, in the front end, matching people between jobs and, uh, and, and interests and then helping them through the journey all the way to the point that they're successful in life in, in, in the community. So. That is a brief sort of a, a quick a summary of what and why I am doing this. And the reason I am passionate about this is because I think it's an important human rights issue. I think it's a human, uh, it's something that we have to be aware of. And it's something that we have to make a difference on because there's discrimination in terms of many, many different factors. And this is one of them that gets hidden or not addressed. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is I'm just going to call out names and if you can just give a very brief introduction of who you are and then and then after that I will ask the questions. Let me start with Bill. Okay, I'm Bill Harrigan. My company is Harrigan Solutions and uh, it's a business. Uh, we are a for-profit business that hires almost exclusively people uh, that are uh, justice involved. We have 60 employees and so you can kind of do the math on it. And um, I'm uh, lucky enough to be a person who late in life figured out what, I, what I'm uh, pretty good at and what I love to do. Uh, and I realized looking back, what I did all those years really wasn't all that much fun. <laughs> so um, that's who I am. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this in a bit. Eric? Yeah, how's it going? My name is uh, Eric Carranza. I was um, incarcerated about 2011, so 10 years ago. I got back in the system and I wanted to make a change. So ever since then, I've just been trying to help people as much as I could. I became a personal trainer because fitness was one of those things that really helped me. And being able to help people and be involved in the community was really meaningful for me. And I try to do that as much as I can. So that's just who I am. I'm here to share my experiences today. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Jamie? Um, my name is Jamie DeJesus, and before I introduce myself, I just want to thank the Rotary for wanting to help clean up their backyard and help fix the fences. So I've been incarcerated <clears throat> for 23 years of my life and in the system since 1997. I recently discharged off of uh, supervision on March 11th, and what I did was I used my transferable skills from my previous life of crime into manufacturing and manufacturing industry. I'm currently a manufacturing skills standard counselor instructor for certified production technician. Uh, I have my own business, um, Innovative Solutions to Consulting, and I'm contracted by my mentor, Dr. George Garland from Innovative Educational Solutions Institute to do a pre-apprenticeship program for CNC approved by the state. And, you know, I just believe in paying it forward. Somebody gave, my, gave me my second chance and I've had a strong support system, so I made it a necessary change in my life to pay it forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Sylvester? Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation and opportunity to uh, speak with you all. Uh, my name is Sylvester Jackson. I'm directly impacted, uh, meaning that uh, I did time in the judicial system. I served 10 years in the state of, uh, state of Wisconsin. Uh, from 2007 to 2017, uh, where by the grace of God, I learned uh, within that 10 years how to be free from the 30 years of imprisonment of the mind and um, learning how to find and identify who I really was and what it was I wanted in life, uh, which led me down the road of uh, advocating and uh, getting into uh, the area I'm at now, which is uh, I'm a lead organizer for EXPO, which stands for Ex Incarcerated People Organizing and uh, giving back to uh, those who's coming home, those who still remain behind the wall to come out and know that uh, if they choose to do different, they can make it out here. I'm also the founder of BLOCK, which stands for Blacks Liberating Our Community Through Knowledge, uh, which is a grassroots organization that's uh, built around educating um, the communities about uh, sustainability. Sustainability. Thank you. Natraj. Is muted. Yeah, 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 yeah. The other thing about uh, Sylvester is that he does uh, 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 circles, uh, justice circles, uh, where he brings uh, people together, uh, both from the victim side and the perpetrator side and from the community side, and they have conversations about each other, and they learn about the fact that uh, life is more about, uh, about understanding and listening. So I have two questions that I'm going to ask. The first question is... A lot of people have, in the course of my adventures here, have asked me, you know, have told me at least, hey, why should I hire a person who's formerly incarcerated? Because first of all, they committed a crime. Second of all, how do I trust them? Uh, and I've heard from the grapevine that uh, they don't come on time, they slack off here, and uh, they do other types of uh, uh, activities, which, you know, doesn't really contribute to their success. So I'm going to start with Bill. Well, you actually hired um, justice-involved individuals. So what have you seen about it? Well, let's see. I think, um, you know, it's not, it's not easy. It, it can be a lot of fun. You have to understand what the obstacles are, uh, you know, uh, understand what it's like for someone to grow up perhaps in poverty or to have been traumatized in their life to have some respect for that and uh some patience and and to want to uh want to help people along and, and uh, if you have sort of a a moral imperative kind of a thought process i think that helps a lot um so uh, and i think um if you have a business you're going to have to have people so you have, maybe as a matter of um uh, you're just going to have to do that so so have, what have you found in terms of the uh, work ethics of individuals uh, who are formerly uh, just as involved? Well, well, that depends on us, actually. And, and I have some stories that I'd love to you know, kind of share with you. And I have a couple of slides I could share with you about, sure. about uh, this, if you'd like. Is this, is this a time to do that or should we just kind of do some questioning? Uh, let's do some questioning and then we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, Eric, from your perspective, uh, what have you seen as the sort of pushback in terms of reintegrating back into society that, and this is a question for you, Jamie and, 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 and Sylvester too, uh, which is what, 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 are, what are the pushback that you've seen and what is your fundamental belief system about other people who are incarcerated or justice involved in terms of their work ethic and their uh, commitment to work? Eric? So some of the things that I see is 
from my own personal experience, uh, a business employer might not hire you because of a prior conviction. No matter how well suited you are for that job or for that position, if you have that criminal background, they're just not going to take a second look at you. You know, I've gone through a lot of um, a lot of those experiences, and I know a lot of people that will go through similar experiences just because of convictions, prior convictions. So even if you're like the best possible candidate for a job, a business owner might not take a look at you because of that conviction. So that can be really hard, and that can really really make someone feel detrimental about you know any any chance of hope. So that to me is uh, that that has to change for sure. Uh, Jamie, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, to invest in somebody who's coming home from from prison um, is, is, is a great thing when you get the right individuals. Um, you know, we, we we come out and some of us are not stable yet. You know, and then we hit the ground running and we're bombarded with all of these different uh, life circumstances and maybe living, having to live with somebody and, you know, having a, uh, undying loyalty to them to be there. So because they were there for you and then you want to, you know, make the wrong moves to get back in to pay them back instead of taking care of themselves first. Um, I was very fortunate in my situation with my support system. And, um, you know, I got came out and hit the ground running and almost burned myself out before it was pointed out to me, like, you know, why don't you just take a break? And, you know, my fiance told me this, like, take a break. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you with it and get some more training. Uh, help me ground myself. But, you know, not everybody that comes from prison is, is a bad person. They just make bad choices. So once they get themselves grounded, and um, that's why I became involved with the transition to living facility to, to help try to build our own community, to give them the, you know, the, the free time to focus on their self and, and get training and, and build the disciplines that it takes to be able to make it to work on time and take care of your mental health and, and structure your life so you have more time for yourself. Um, but, it, you know, you get in a strong workforce. Many of us work for pennies on the dollar for years. And uh, when we get home, we just want that opportunity. So if you uh, choose to hire a justice involved person, in most instances, you'll get that loyalty back, the same loyalty back from them for believing in them that you that you're looking for that you give them and give them that second chance that's a very good point uh, jamie which is if you believe in them they will believe in you that's right okay. uh, sylvester well uh in short i know uh personally after uh, i got out in 17 uh one of the uh hardest obstacles I had to overcome was not being seen for who I was, but being placed in a statistic, you know, of uh, like everyone come out of prison, just one of the same and not being seen as an individual. Um, that's one of the main things that I think uh, people in the community have to overcome, especially those employers, because even uh, individuals who do not experience being incarcerated, you still can't no more trust them than you can based upon what they show you, you know, when they come to your employment place to work. You know, I know more people that never been to prison that refuse jobs than I do people that come out of prison have, you know, but the individuals that come out, we come out with a mindset to do better, you know, and part of that is employment. You know, I got out homeless, no money, no resources, no material belongings, simply on the street. But I had a determination to succeed. And I went through temp services. And finally, I was blessed to get this position where I'm at with Expo and later went from just an organizer to the lead organizer of this chapter. So I had to apply myself to be where I am today, which is in a position to help other people coming out. And now not only am I in a position to help others, I'm in a position where we have helped other individuals get employment. So it's all about looking at each individual that come before you for who they are and give them that chance to show you what they're about and what they can do. Excellent. Uh so the, one of the questions, one of the things that came out in this discussion was perceptions. 
any idea can you give me a sort of a, 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 a bill a and maybe this is a point where you could even show us what you do in terms of how do you change the perceptions of the community to say that you don't look at the person's papers and it says uh, uh, justice involved and, and and automatically that name goes to the bottom of the pile so help me are you're asking how might we change the perception of people in the community yeah is that what you're saying yep um you know i've really stopped thinking about that i kind of thought the community would care more i thought the business community would care more and, and i would say that uh they're not really thinking about it for its own sake i just don't think it and, and so for me i i focus on uh how do we help people succeed and and then let the world see them i guess would be uh, my approach but um uh, just um uh, i think there's a lot of lip service paid to diversity and giving people a chance i just think it's um I, i'm i was very disappointed to find that out and uh i'm i think a lot differently about that now why you know, I, I thought that uh, when people would see what we do, uh, that they would say, I want to get on board with that, that I both need work done because we're a contractor, we do contract services. And I thought that they would either say, I want to be, uh, I want to learn how you do this because candidly, we do it well because I need to do that. And I, I have never heard anybody ask me how we do it ever. Uh, it, you know, with the intention of wanting to duplicate that. And um, I have not run across, I've run across very few people who want to do this because of, you know, for moral reasons. And, and that includes organizations that have said, you know, we're, we've signed this diversity pledge and we have this diversity per, a person in charge of it. But I, I, my experience is that really is a, a great deal of lip service. It, it was a huge surprise to me. But, you know, that's, that's, in my mind, that's what it is. So, Eric, are you there? Yes. Oh, okay. You disappeared from my screen. So, okay. So, uh, you said you had a couple of slides that you wanted to share, Bill. Did you yes, want to do that? If now? I could. And so, yeah. All right. Let, Very let briefly. Yeah. Pardon me? Very briefly. All right. Well, then let's. Um, hmm. hmm. You should be able to share. Yep. All right. Yep. So I'm going to do a sway so it's quick. Nothing is seen. Oh. While we're waiting for Bill to do that, I, Jamie had his hand up for, he wanted to comment. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to um, piggyback off of Bill a little bit because, you know, I've worked with Bill. I've known Bill for a few years now and when, when, when COVID hit, um, I was I was out of work for a while, and you know I reached out to him, asked him if he had anything for me to do, and he brought me right on the team doing COVID cleanup. Um, it was not ideal for my life circumstances, so I had to refrain from working that because my fiance is high risk. But you know he has a phenomenal plan that he has together with the, the peer mentors and the work coordinator. So they really address the, um, the maybe the instability if you're having a hard day. Uh, so, you know, I, I tip my hat to Bill and Dave for um, Dave Stern for what they do and, and how they interact with their employees. Wonderful. Hey, you're on, you're on mute, Bill. You're on mute. Technology is tough. Okay, how about now? <laughs> good, good. Now we can hear you, and you just got a plug from Jamie. Do you uh, do you see a, my screen at all? Do you see us? Yes, uh, we can see your screen. Yes. All right. So um, I'm going to do this quickly, if this allows me to. So look, uh, we build trustworthy teams. The key word is trust. We build trust with individuals. Without that, you have nothing. And we use an asset-based approach. That's because we identify and uh, help people build their unique strengths. There's an important reason for that. We don't know people as uh, 
problems or for the, the things that they've done, we see the strength in them and it's critical that we do that. And our, we have a business model around uh, consistently uh, inspiring extraordinary effort with them. And so it's a system. We have built a system. So why don't people succeed? Uh, if you look at the bottom rung here, research says 85% of why people are not successful. You need to uh, move your slides up. Again? Yep. We're on, the, we're on the first slide. We well, grow trustworthy teams. Well, that's crazy. All right. Um, so let's do, uh, well, maybe I should just uh, talk a little bit, okay? Yeah. Let's forget this slide. All right, so the, the deal is that the research says that um, uh, why people are unsuccessful in life and work is emotional intelligence. So 85% of why people aren't successful is that. And so it's critical that we address that. The other part of that is trauma and people that have been in trauma have significant challenges. Number one, uh, when someone experiences trauma in their life, their emotional uh, intelligence or their their uh, that emotional development stops at that point. It is arrested. Uh, number two is they end up with mental models that don't serve them well. And uh, they are uh, neurologically, they're impaired. And so um, it's a, that's a, a, a problem. Now I got to Okay, let's see. Hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry about this, folks, but I, I have all kinds of stuff happening here. Uh, so, um, Trauma, mental models. I grew up in trauma, okay? I would look at all of you folks that are men and I would say, you're going to hurt me. And so um, I, I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to uh, try to show you that I know what I'm talking about, even though I know that I don't. I will do anything to protect myself. Coming out of trauma, you have mental models that get in the way and it requires uh, some work to work around it. The biggest question I would ask anyone here to consider if they want to hire and develop people um, are uh, justice involved is a uh, couple things. One is, um, do you view, I mean, do you have a belief system that includes the fact that people development is a means to better productivity? We develop people to do work better in a more productive fashion, like lean manufacturing. If you don't believe that, don't try it. And, and the other thing is, do you have a curiosity and an interest in raising the emotional intelligence of the people that you hire? If you don't, don't go there. Uh, because it is these really uh, important cultural business practices like lean and engagement that get people going. And uh, that's critical. So um, a couple of examples, and I think we can go on from there. So Precious Johnson, is a person who came to us, uh, she was abducted, she was sex trafficked, drug addicted, drug dealer, incarcerated. And if you saw my screen, you'd see a picture of her at her graduation uh, from Gateway Technical. And so uh, why, do I, uh, why do I bring this up? Uh, is she uh, different from us or is she the same? I mean, the folks that you're talking about hiring, are they different than us? Are we better than them? Uh, are, is, are we to look down? The fact is, what makes us the same is we all want to to win. Every flipping one of us wants to win. We just don't know exactly how to do that. So every one of us wants to be with people that want to be with them. Everybody wants to be good at something. Everybody wants to have meaning. Everyone wants to be known. If you can look at people in that way and say, I have respect for where you come from and a little bit of patience, and, uh, and uh, we're willing to, uh, to uh, work with them on the basis of their assets and where they're heading and we help them that way, uh, it can be a fabulous relationship. I'll give you one more example and then you can do what you want, okay? <laughs> Elijah, Elijah came to us, lousy worker. All those uh, descriptors you had before, Elijah. But one day we said to Elijah, would you be able to help us with those great skills you have, do this work for us safer, faster, uh, or easier? And he said, come back tomorrow, let's talk about it. So he's doing a job that takes two hours and 45 minutes. And the next day we come back and he's got a whiteboard and he's diagrammed the whole process. And he took this two hour and 45 minute job and took it down to one hour. 
So in one day, he went from crappy worker, candidly, to professor. What changed? He got to be the hero. He got to step up into something he can be good at. And he was wonderful. And then from there, he had a personal vision of success that we were willing to invest in. We cared about his getting to become his best self, which to him was to be a, own a barbershop. So we helped him own a barbershop. So there are a lot of pieces in here. Summary statement. The most motivating thing uh, that we can do uh, uh, for someone is to help them identify their unique strengths, a personal vision of success, a self-transcendent purpose, and lay the uh, uh, and have a, a culture where we get them to be heroes and to do so in a deliberate fashion. So, Sylvester, what do you think of what Bill said? Well, From a perspective uh, of I self uh, 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 promoting the self. Well, um, that actually is. Uh, is actually uh, what we all do in, in one way or the other. You know, uh, you know, we set ourselves to what it is we're trying to attract. You know, uh, individual. You know, here's the thing: when you're standing with a mindset that everyone coming out of prison uh, can't be trusted, they're not going to do A, B, or C because of their past then pretty much that's just your mindset and that's where you're going to be standing until somebody sway you different. Uh, truth of the matter is when individuals come to prison or go to prison, in a lot of instances, more than not, a person get a chance to really reflect and find out what it is that caused them in that place where it led them down that road. And, and like... Um, excuse me, like Bill was saying, you know, the trauma that goes with it. In, in criminal justice system, they see one aspect of crime, and that's the criminal act. They don't look at the mental part that also plays a very critical part of a person's life that led down that road. So when we come out, we come out with all kind of obstacles against us. But the biggest hurdle and, and, and the biggest misperception is that we all the same, like I said before, uh, individual have to be given that opportunity to show who they are. Uh, I believe it was Miss Kathleen said in the chat, how can you uh, trust uh, individuals? You know, um, that it, it, I'm not sure the question of how do you trust someone who was incarcerated uh, for say theft in a retail situation well, you know, in a situation like that, uh, you wouldn't take a person trying to overcome alcohol addiction and put them in a liquor store. No more than you would take a person that's addicted to drugs to stick them in a drug store. So you have to find a person and meet them at their point of need, not by putting them in a place that can cause them to you know the self-destruct. And you have to do that individually with individuals when they come home. Uh, like I said, when I come home, all odds against me, the PO was trying to send me back to prison. I was determined before I walked out of prison that I was going to make it. And one of my first job was $9 an hour cleaning toilets. I was glad to clean the toilets. Why? I learned to humble myself while cleaning them toilet because I knew that's not going to be my life calling, but it was a stepping stone to where I had to go. And so I accepted cleaning the toilet because I knew in the end, that was something greater for me up the road if I sustained the road and I, I complete the course. So you can't think that everybody is, is, is a certain way and expect to really open up to a person uh, without some form of bias. You have to give each person that opportunity, just like in life. Everyone that's around has never been to prison doesn't mean they never broke laws. I mean, they just haven't been caught, you know, but do that make them a bad person when it comes down? Some of them is your neighbor, some of them is your friends, but you have to get to know the person that's sitting in front of you for who they are. And, and, and that's why I keep going with that. You know, judge me based upon who I am today, not on what I've done yesterday. 
because today is where I live. Yesterday is where I was. We all make bad choices, but should that bad choice cost me the rest of my life for poverty, rejection? No. You know, if I'm showing you that I can contribute to society in a productive manner, then give me that opportunity to do so. So, Jamie, one of the things that you've talked about is the fact that, uh, you know, uh, if you're going to hire someone, hire them with the intention to promote them, right? What do you mean by that? And you, you, I, when I've talked to you earlier on, uh, you had said, and I'm, I, I just want you to sort of go through that mental process of why you think that's important. Well, it, it's important for a few reasons. Uh, you know, once once we prove ourselves, you know, because in, in the state of Wisconsin, <clears throat> they have something called truth and sentencing. So we do day for day. There's no good time. We in, in our mind, we haven't been rewarded in a long time <clears throat> for anything that we've done. So it's it, it's. And it, and it might not be a, a, a major promotion or, you know, it's, it's just an extra, extra incentive when review time comes around. Um, and as long as, as long as we're doing what we're supposed to do, and if they take the, um, it, the initiative to, to get more training or, or, or go the extra mile on the job or, or they build them good disciplines, um, you know, just, you know, do what you can to uh, reward them in a small way. And it might, it sometimes it might not even be a raise. It just be like, some extra encouragement or, or extra praise to them. Um, I saw some chats in the comment um, area referring to the, the training that's in the DOC. And what got me into my trade, I just wanted to share this quick, was I was in the first CNC mobile trailer. I was in the first class uh, from Gateway College that was in the CNC mobile trailer at Racine Correctional Institution. And that saved my life. I went in there, I, uh, I took care of my business. I graduated top of my class, 4.0 GPA. And I was able to speak in front of the Lieutenant Governor at the time, um, the Secretary of the DOC. And then um, after that, I, I, I came out and I, I went right with the machining. And uh, when I met Bill, I, he's, hey, oh, you do uh, CNC maintenance. I'm talking about all about that. We just clean the machines. so. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a great thing that the vocational programs are there and people will not, they will deny transfers to stay and take their training because they're so dedicated to what it is that they want. So, um, yeah, I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, from your perspective, what, what do you believe is the need to sort of look at it from the perspective of employer, employee? You have your own business, so, you know, but you, you started that on your own. But how would you view the whole perspective of if you were to hire a person now who is just as involved, what would you do? I would look at the one of the first things that you were talking about, the identity, right? What have they done to help or develop themselves? If there's no track record of someone that's actually trying to better themselves, then, you know, that's it doesn't matter if you're convicted or not if a person is not there to help themselves become better um i'm not going to look at that person but if someone has a track record of you know going to vocational classes or developing themselves to contribute to their community that's a person that i want in my team convictions or not so that's what i look for which brings me to my second question which is uh, really given the fact that you have individual journeys I'm going to start the other way around here with Eric what were the obstacles that you faced that you had to overcome to make your success yourself successful and yeah, how I mean and and, and, and and a corollary to that is how would you think if we were to look at it from a rotary perspective we could help I love that question yeah, there's definitely been obstacles that have been thrown my way uh, just because of the prior convictions that I've had. I've got through, had to go through so much paperwork, uh, had to go through so many courts. I, I basically have to prove myself every single day to the people that I'm you know, trying to network with, trying to do business with. It's, a, it's definitely a tough battle, but my passion and my goals definitely drive me to become and to overcome these obstacles. So as Rotary, 
you know, what we can do is just help these people find hope, find a level of contribution, find, yeah, the biggest thing is hope, you know, because that's, that's what Rotary is there to do is just help people. Uh, it's a great organization. So I'm glad I'm with Rotary Amigos. It's like a big family for me. What would you uh, say, Jamie? Obstacles. Um, <clears throat> was uh, My obstacle was my mental health and stability and being able to, to handle everything coming at me at once. Like I said, I have a, I have a very strong support system. Um, I, you know, I pay homage to her all the time. It's my fiance. I met her 11 days after I was out and we worked together. I, you know, I was dealing with a lot of family issues, trying to reunify my family with my with my children because I was gone for four years and then I was out for 18 months and I was gone for another seven. My kids were three when I left, eight when I came back, and 10 when I left again. I came home and they're grown. So the, the major issues for me was just the family reunification. I've always had a work ethic. And um, once you, and it's painful, it's very painful to go through these things. And not only with your children, but with the rest of your family and, and the same people, places, and things. So, um, for me, I had to reinvent myself. I went from the south side to the north side to take my training and help rebuild my life. And then everything, as long as I was doing the right thing, I found that things were coming to a lot faster and it was a lot easier as I went on. And I think really basically that's what it comes down to is learning within yourself to be able to you know, treat others how you want to be treated and give them that, that spark of hope that they, they can do something, that they can do it. And um, that's what I um, <clears throat> strive for now. I'm involved with a transitional living facility right now. And I think a big way that we can help this narrative is um, with me, Sylvester, and a couple other nonprofit agencies, Ruben Ganoa and uh, The Way Out. Um, we're trying to build our own community. So we can have training resources, transitional living resources, um, for those of you who don't know what transitional living is, is that if uh, somebody comes out like in Sylvester's situation and doesn't have a place to go, the DOC will help them pay for their for their rent to stay in one of these duplexes or we're, we're shooting for something bigger and pay their rent at the same time with the vocation. They can be in vocational, live in the same place where the vocational is at and they'll have the support of the reentry community in addition to the support of the partners that are engaging with us. Um, I think that's critical for our success and for the future of the DOC or justice involved coming, coming home, uh, especially, you know, there's like 30,000 inmates that's gonna be released in the next four or five years. Well, it's a tremendous workforce coming out. And if we can prepare them to make them changes in their life and give them them skills, I think we're gonna uh, be able to help our economy out a, a, a great deal. Sylvester, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, my biggest obstacle was again was um, coming out homeless. Uh, on top of the homelessness, I uh, come out as a diagnosed. Uh, diagnosed mental health issue, depression, anxiety. Uh, I come out uh, with uh, sleep apnea, which requires you with uh, to use a top machine, which you have to plug in, which is kind of hard to do when you're living outside. Um, I had a PO that just was inhuman and inhumane in all ways you could see. Uh, a person that's supposed to be uh, helping you uh, come out and get in your uh, lane and you know help you get to uh, where you're trying to go to. I had a PO that wouldn't even give me a bus ticket back to my house after I reported in, after I first got out with no money. But you know, I was told by her that DOC don't provide house. Six months later, I found out that was. TLP, like Brother D. Who's, uh, D uh, Jose was just saying, it's just uh, all of those things that I faced, I was determined not to let them deter me from what I had in my heart to do. 
So the obstacle was there. Uh, the ignorance in the community based upon politicians and authority positions, uh, authority people who profit off mass incarceration, who profit off fear factors in the community and, you know, better their uh, political, political careers and stuff by uh, putting false information in the community. All of those things were obvious. But one of the worst ones was the fact that I was a 50 year old black man coming back in the community with a felony, you know, uh, from a 23 year manufacturing uh, life, you know, uh, body and already went through everything, including you no know, back problem, knee problem. So physical problem was there. But I just knew that in spite of all of that, you know, it all at the end of the day was up to me to decide whether or not I was going to overcome these obstacles. And I, I thank God that he gave me the right peoples in the right place at the right time to help me overcome those obstacles. But they're going to be there for everyone in life. You know, people coming home is no different than anyone that's in the community. Uh, we individuals, we make bad choices in life. Everyone does. But, you know, we come home pretty much most of us just want an opportunity to show what we can do and where we can fit in. And if given that opportunity, where you advance at when you hire people like uh, myself and other individuals who have that mindset is you get a loyal worker. You know, I sit in this office sometimes 12, 13 hours a day. I run the office by myself since the COVID been uh, going on. Everybody in this office pretty much do they work from home. I'm here because I know someone gonna come through that door needing help. And if no one is here, that person don't get help. I know what that felt like. I don't want no one to come out and don't have no resources or nowhere to turn for help. So I'm here. So I'm loyal, you know, and my job is more than a paycheck. You know, at the end of the day, it pays my bill, but I have what's called a conscience and salvation that I look at too. And I have to make the decision that helps me to be a better person. And that to me is more important than a paycheck. You know, a paycheck, we all can have, but man, to have a desire to help someone and have it come from a spiritual, God felt place, there, there's no price that I can put on that. So, Bill, I'm going to turn that question a little around to, for you, which is trauma is a issue for people going into incarceration, but the trauma is also an issue when they come out because the lives that they lead is so different from society in the sense that inside you're basically regimented to doing things at the right time. And if you don't do the right, you know, uh, uh, right, if you don't follow the rules, you're penalized. Outside, you don't have any rules and you're supposed to create your own rules. Have you had, what is your, what is your perspective on one trauma? And second, how you help people break down the, inf this, the mental infrastructure that is built up while incarcerated? Well, okay. So, um, trauma, um, changes our, how our brains work. Uh, when we met, when we uh, grow up in poverty and in trauma, uh, the world tells us we're jerks. Okay. And the, unfortunately, then we take that upon ourselves and we tell ourselves that we're jerks and, um, it, it requires being in relationship and all these folks that are speaking are awesome at relationship. You, nothing happens without relationship. Uh, but what has to follow are the deliberate practices that help people build different neural pathways. Uh, it's it is um, it's neuroplasticity. You know, to get really fancy about the whole thing, it is how do we use deliberate practices that consistently help people with the obstacles in their minds, consistently help people with the what intrinsically motivates them. Um, how do we do these things deliberately every single day and design them into a business process wrapped in, in our case, lean manufacturing, 
that we consistently help them to change the messaging in their brains. It's, it is, uh, the research is there, the deliberate practices have to be developed and um, that's what does it. Excellent. I actually have a video that I want to share at this point. And this is something uh, that was put together by Wendy Bauman from Vivek. And so I'm going to do that. And I am not sure uh, the reason I didn't do it earlier is because I do not know how to share a <laughs> video uh, in Zoom. <laughs> well, well, I'm not going to be the one to show you how to share anything. So. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Mitraj, while you're working on that, Sylvester wanted to comment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to uh, something uh, around the trust issue uh, before we get too far off it. Uh, I want to show an example of uh, an individual come here in the office about two months ago, and uh, he had just got out of prison. He'd been in and out of prison ever since he was a juvenile. He's 36 years old right now. And uh, we worked with him, and uh, he got him a job. Uh, I met him through the circles of support that Najee just told everyone about. And uh, he come in and talk with me, and he got him a job. And within three days, the person who was picking him up, car had an accident. And so he told me that, you know, uh, he didn't have a way to work. Uh, only option I had was help him or not. And the only way I knew I could help him is make sure he can get to work. So I went out and bought him a car. Not out of my pocket, but I bought it using my money with the trust that he would pay that money back so I can pass that blessing on to someone else. So I went out the next day, found a car, purchased the car, called him, gave him the keys to the car. And then we had a little run in with a title thing. So he had to wait three weeks. So I gave him the keys to one of my vehicles and called the insurance, put him on my insurance. And at the end of the day, he still have a job. He still can help his family. He still can help his kids. That's, that's trust. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and do this. Uh, I'm supposed to do share uh, video mute. You needed to click that Natraj before you share with us. Yeah. You yeah. have it up on your screen. Click the audio portion and the share and then it should work. Okay. I got the share going on. You, you should be able to see that, right? Yes. The, the screen with Wendy's thing. Yep. Uh, I am now. Uh, you need to go back out. In other words, close that, please. I need to go back out. Yep. And then okay. when you bring it up on your computer, you'll see the yeah. options on the bottom. It says share audio. Yeah. Then share. You have to sh share the audio first and then share. I don't see that. Uh, multiple participants, one advanced sharing options. No. Okay, I'm going to try it. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to stop. Just let me know if, it, if the audio shows. Um, that's the reason I didn't play it up earlier on. Uh, I understand Bill's... Uh, uh, plight on this whole matter. Hello, fellow Rotarians. Can you hear? Yes. I've been a member of World Rotary yeah. for 33 some years. I was the first woman actually in Milwaukee North Shore Rotary Club and have been a Rotarian ever since and plan on continuing to be in Rotary. I'm specifically sharing something today that our district, I know, is beginning to dedicate resources and energy and awareness building to, and that's around individuals who formerly were incarcerated, individuals living with criminal records. I'd like to be with you in person and share some of my experiences, but instead I decided to tape this so that it could be shared with many clubs as we begin to build the awareness of this important initiative and care of individuals. So a couple things, when I began my career, I actually first thought that I was going to be have an entire career in the criminal justice system. As an intern, I have my undergrad degree from UWM, but I was living in Green Bay for about one year. 
and I interned at the Sanger B. Powers Correctional Facility. All male facility, minimum security, individuals that in the next few years would be released and begin to live back with their families and become productive citizens and individuals in the community. I actually wrote a paper that was later published about really re-entry and the importance of working with families and employers in assisting individuals in that difficult transition. Now I'm with the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation or WIBIC. And WIBIC is a statewide economic development corporation, as we say, putting dreams to work. And we work with individuals specifically focusing on women, on people of color, black and Hispanic Latinx businesses, on lower wealth individuals, veterans, and military connected families, and also individuals that were formerly incarcerated and are living with criminal records because there's an unlevel playing field. Different individuals have often different views about these groups and populations, and our, organ is there to, our organization is there to try to level those playing fields. Speaking specifically about individuals that were incarcerated, we fought hard with the SBA to allow Small Business Administration to provide loan capital to individuals who formerly had a criminal record. Now that's been advanced and we're able to lend to individuals, and we lent to them before using different funding sources. We have many individuals that we work with that were formerly incarcerated, that have great entrepreneurial ideas and are back in creating their own businesses, expanding their own businesses and employing other individuals. We believe in second chances. As a Rotarian, believing in service above self, I ask you to carefully listen to the presentation being presented today and see what you can do as an employer, as an individual that perhaps um, also has a business as an individual who is involved in the community and think what you can do as a fellow Rotarian to support individuals who have made mistakes, who have served their sentence, and who are now back and want to be really, again, productive members of our community. They need a second chance. They need your support. And as fellow Rotarians, it's what we're about. Thank you. So, yeah, that was uh, Wendy and I, um, uh, was part of, uh, I moved from the uh, Milwaukee North Shore Club to the Milwaukee Downtown Club, but uh, I'm still, the, the, the Milwaukee North Shore Club is the one that has sponsored the RCC program, so I'm indebted to them for this uh, opportunity to do this. But uh, yeah, Wendy was so gracious to do this uh, presentation for me uh, when I asked her, and uh, so as Rotarians, I think we are. Uh, we have another ten minutes left here. So, as Rotarians, my message to all of you is: is is is. Let's figure out a way to create a network that employs people who are justice involved, and uh, any way I can be a source of uh, a, a, a catalyst to do that. Bill, Jamie, uh, my, Sylvester, and Eric, let me know. Um, my final thoughts on the subject, uh, and as we close out, is is if you were to look at the next three to five years, or next year, three to five years, what are the skills, or what are the what are the opportunities that each one of you think you could assist in to make sure? that we have a pipeline from the Rotary perspective that helps you. What what would you like Rotary to do for you? Oh. Jamie? Yeah, you know, I would <laughs> I would love to make this re-entry community happen. We can find a way to facilitate a, a, a property or build a property. Like I said, me and Sylvester went to look at one uh, last on Friday because we're not getting any action from our aldermen's state representatives right now. On uh, everybody's big on the reentry tip, but then when you ask them to come put their money where their mouth is or, or to donate a, 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 a abandoned building from the alderman district so we can build this community for ourselves, that you know that's what I would like to see within the next three to five years, and and in turn. I will train. I'm already doing training. I'll train the best employees you guys ever had. <laughs> and and we can facilitate additional training. If you need any help with um, hiring or, or talking to somebody, if you plan on bringing re-entries in to, to come work for you. I know um, me and Natasha are working on a deal right now. 
with um, the Train 75 machinists over the next year or two. But, uh, you know, we can, we can come and do on-the-spot training, training in the jobs, or if you need somebody to speak on behalf of them or to them to help mentor them, you know, we got a whole community out here that's that's willing to help with that. Um, everybody from Expo to as organiz the facts in the Expo called Free from the woman's point of view, um, the community, um, the way out, you know, Central Corridor, um, and uh, community warehouse as well on North Avenue. Um, that's what I would like to see in the next three to five years. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Sylvester? Well, what I would like to see is similar to uh, the Jesus, and that is the uh, assistant to build sustainable resource. Um, like he was saying, when we went out and looked at this property uh, the other day, um, I had told him about it because I seen it a while back and I just see the opportunity that it could be. And uh, it's a property that can address so many different aspects of the community and those coming home from incarceration. Uh, it has a school attached to it, a living quarters, and a sanctuary for services. And those are, to me, the main three ingredients to making a, a, a decent life. You know, educating someone, get them a place to lay their head, and then and invite them to something bigger than they self. And uh, within that space, it's just opportunity there to have programs and and rent out space to other organizations, train. Uh, I I would like in five years uh, for Expo to contribute to uh, helping our community through peer support specialists, um, giving individuals coming home uh, that space where they can debrief. When you come out of prison, you know, it, it's not as easy as sound when you're in captivity, because that's what it is for a certain amount of period of time being treated less than a human being and then released with nothing and told, go be successful. So when you come out here, you have a mental thing you have to deal with. So we need to address the mental health. We need to deal with um, that 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 tore down low self-esteem. We need to help build people up from the inside out. And having a place where not only people from uh, coming back from incarceration can come, but people in the community at large can come to that location and find all the resources that they need from training, educating, uh, uh, housing, food. Uh, just that's what I would like to see uh, we get help from the Rotary. And that is help us build something that uh, is sustainable and not something that will keep uh, the community reaching out for grants and loans and, and, and handouts. It's not about that. It's about that old saying, that wise tale, give a person a fish they eat for a day, teach them how to fish, Day for life. Hallelujah, Bill. Uh, is your question what 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 do we need? What would you like to? What? How would you think Rotary can help in the next three to five years in this? Um, you know, I'll go, I'll go back to uh, to what the research says, uh, and, and how are deliberate practices built around that? We're looking at we're looking at a whole bunch of people that just have great passion for all of this stuff. And, and, uh, and that means we're limited to the individuals that deliver on it. There has to be a system of this and, and within a company or an organization, it's how do we all scale that and do similar things that we know are effective in a consistent way. Thank you, thank you. And Eric? I think um, Jamie and Sylvester hit it right on the spot. You know, if we can contribute or help out with a building that's got a lot of those opportunities involved in just one place, that that really just helps tremendously. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for uh, 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 being part of the panel. Uh, uh, just as closing, I just I have a tremendous amount of respect for each one of you. I worked with each one of you in some capacity, and I just wanted to say thank you very much. 
I hope the Rotary community has got some uh, learnings out of this and uh, I hope we can uh, have future sessions possibly with uh, uh, more time and, and more uh, 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 engagement uh, with more other people I mean and so thank you very much Brian for giving us the opportunity and thank you all for attending. Oh, before we leave, um, we do have a few minutes left for question and answer. Um, yeah. yeah. Maria has been doing a great job of filling out information in the chat box along with Angie oh. and others. So there's a lot of information in the chat box. Um, we will close at, at uh, 7.15, but if I did talk to our panelists and if there's a couple of people that still have some questions, they're willing to stay around after 7.15, but the meeting will end at 7.15. And when we do, and a lot of our rotary meetings, we always uh, refer back to our four-way test. So um, is it that the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? I mean, what these gentlemen share tonight was the truth from their hearts. Is it fair to all concerned? Our justice system is not fair to all concerned. We need a drug court for nonviolent crimes. We need to do a lot of things. What do we spend here in Wisconsin to incarcerate someone on an annual basis? Those dollars need to be spent in other ways to build people up, not not incar not not cage them or keep them locked up. <clears throat> Will it be beneficial to all concerned? I think we know what we need to do to make this beneficial to all concerned. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? I hope tonight you'll reach out and meet some of these people face to face to build these relationships, the friendships, to get to know these other people, because we all are in this together. When we heal, we all heal together. So the first question I'd like to let uh, Benny, if she's still with us, if you could unmute yourself. Yes, I am. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you, first of all, first to uh, Jamie and Sylvester and Eric for sharing. I think that's, I think it's extremely brave and courageous for you to come out of what you've experienced and share it with everyone. I'm curious um, if besides vocational training, which I think is fantastic, um, I'm curious if there was any other type of program that you ex experienced within the walls that started to get you to think about, Sylvester, you mentioned changing your mindset. That mindset's different, obviously. We all decide if we're gonna have a good and bad day when we wake up, but something has to change that mindset. And I was just wondering if any of you had a, a certain program within that started that that thought process and in, in changing the way that you were think thinking absolutely if i may answer to that um you know for us to share what i've learned and for me personally you guys are thanking us for being on the on, on this panel and sharing our story this is so healing for us to do with men and to feel the love of other human beings and the, and the support so that, that just really helps us heal more. As far as the program that I took in, 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 in the Department of Corrections, I was at the Resource Center, um, the Wisconsin Resource Center, for um, inmates who have issues and want to really take a look at themselves. And I was in a program called uh, Time of Change with Tamara Omen and Jerome Dillard. Jerome Dillard is the um, owner or the, the, the president, I believe, of Expo with Sylvester. Oops. And that program really, you know, in, in order to get to somewhere like that, you have to go through a litany of things within the DOC to get there because that's personal self-reflection. Um, as far as the other programs that are within the DOC, a lot of that stuff is scripted, you know, and those programs, uh, if you're not ready for change, they help, they help to make you a better criminal, you know. So it's just, that person has to be ready. You know, my take a person one time, two times, three times. It took me 11 and a half years out of my life to be able to make these decisions and uh, find out why I kept going. You know, when I went back for the seven years, I was still in the joint selling dope. I mean, still in prison selling drugs and getting hot. I tried, got caught and I'm like, man, what are you doing? You just went through a traumatic experience at the House of Correction, dealing with the DA on your person, on your pretrial detainment. And if you want to litigate to, to get this back, you can't do it to where you're at. So I had to, you know, stop and you know, just put a total end to it. And um, I taught myself how to litigate, taught myself how to draw, 
became an artist in there and then made that initiative to keep moving forward. So at the end of the day, it's on the person, but with a good mentor, they can do it. Yeah, I've seen uh, things in my life that uh, no young person should see or uh, experience things in my life that no young person should experience. Uh, you know, from the age of seven to 13, I was sexually abused by a female friend of my older sister. And at a young age, I seen a dead body on my way to get milk. I was about 10. And um, growing up in Chicago, you know, it's a horrific scene. Poverty beyond imagine, you know, so hungry to where I tried to take flour and water and fry it in hair grease to find something to eat. To see my mother try to raise 11 kids on her own. Uh, those things have mental um, consequences in life. When I went to prison, the one thing that I found in there that helped me uh, make that decision in my life was one, first and foremost, I got to know God for who he is to me. That was my first thing. I found out for my first, who is God. Second was, it was a, a class they had called forgiveness. It was a circle. That was my first introduction to circles uh, of support. And it was a forgiveness class. And I learned how to forgive myself, move forward. The study went on everybody else to forgive me for my yesterday. I had to learn to forgive myself in order for me to move past my yesterday. And that prepared me so when I come out here that I'm not uh, undecided, you know, and undecided on which way I want to go. Uh, I've been drug and alcohol free for 16 years, 17 years as of, as a matter of fact, this past April. Uh, I don't even smoke no more, you know, so I've been tobacco free because I made up my mind what's going to help me. I need to grab a hold and hold on to it for life. What's going to hurt me? I need to let go. Thank you. I think Angie's next. I put it in the chat just. My first job out of college was working with adjudicated youth, nine to 15 years of age. That was the 80s. It was working. And our government, our new president got rid of funding. How important do you guys think it is for us to go and start with those adjudicated youth to help them not be on this journey of incarceration? No, the, the youth is the future. And it always is with every generation. Um, it's, it's a terrible thing that, that that funding got cut. Right now, um, I'm a member of the Black and Latino Male Achievement that's in high school for mentor mentorship. And I have another side business venture with my former probation and parole officer. It's called Both Sides of the Fence. We have a podcast out. And part of her, um, she has another business that she started called Reality Check by Kim, where she goes into the high school and I go in there with her and I work with her and talk to the high schoolers. And then we're gonna to try to go down to the middle schoolers next, but it, that's that's so crucial and so detrimental to the future of humanity as a whole. Um, if we can get, you know, I'm working on robotics training now, Lego robotics, when I can get some spare time, but if we can get something like that back into the school system and, you know, start instituting robotics to, you got to capture them and you capture the mind and give them something that no matter what's going on at home, they come to school, come to a program and that can be a safe place. It, it, it mean, it'll, it'll mean so much to them and, you know, install some of our humanitarian beliefs in them to want to help each other. Uh, yeah, you know, today. It's a wise saying that I heard uh, a gentleman who got out of prison after doing 40 years shared with me uh, this year. He said, it is easier to educate a child than it is to fix a grown man. I 
I, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Again, thank you everyone for this uh, personal sharing, truth telling, and an opportunity to help us grow. We'll have another session coming up. Uh, this is DEI session number five. Uh, we have another one scheduled for July. It will be coming up um, and look for it in your inbox invitation. Again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and um, take care. Thank you all, thank you all. Have a yeah. blessed evening. Eric, looking forward to meeting you in person.